have uh, Dr. Samir uh, Kashyap, uh, who's going to be presenting to us. I think, Andreas, you're going to be uh, introducing him? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll introduce him. Should we uh, skip the slides today uh, for him? There we go. All right, thanks everybody. Uh, good morning. So today we're gonna have Dr. Samir, Samir Kashyap, uh, who's an assistant professor here in Mayo Clinic, Florida. Uh, he's, he's in the vascular team. Uh, next slide, please. So he obtained his BA at the University of Kansas. Uh, then he went on to get his medical de degree at the Kansas City University of Medicine and Biosciences. Uh, he then did a pre-residency pre fellowship at the University of New Mexico, and then went on to re residency at Riverside University. I do apologize, I made a mistake right there. Uh, he is right, he finished residency and is now a fellow of open cerebrovascular and endovascular surgery here at Mayo with us in Florida. And he uh, got the rank of assistant professor of neurosurgery last year as well. You can see that he has a lot of academic awards that are highlighted down there. And then next slide, please. You're going to see his most cited publications. So as you can see, he has been academically productive and highly cited, which is reflected in his H index uh, of eight right here. Uh, so next slide. Thank you, Samir, for presenting this morning with us. Your plaque is actually in the office. So next time you're around, I'll make sure to give it to you and please take it away. All right. <clears throat> Thank you for that introduction. I appreciate it. Um, let's see, pulling up my presentation here. You see that okay? Yes. All right. Um, thanks for giving me the opportunity to talk to you this morning. Um, so uh, what I wanted to talk about today was uh, the topic of revascularization of uh, chronic carotid occlusion and how we optimize patient selection for that. Uh, you know, I have nothing to disclose. So, um, you know, if you look at the if you look at the recent statistics, uh, about seven hundred fifty thousand people have ischemic strokes per year, and about two hundred fifty thousand are diagnosed with TIAs per year. So, I would even say that's a, that's an underestimate. Um, but we have you add that up, it's over about a million people per year experience some sort of ischemic event. And about 15 to 25% of those are attributed to ipsilateral chronic occlusions. And we know that the management of symptomatic carotid occlusive disease is well researched and supported in literature. Um, you know, if you uh, search carotid artery disease on PubMed, you get over 72,000 results. Um, you have several studies discussing carotid endarterectomy, carotid stenosis, and there's very good data to support revascularization in that sort of context. But what we um, end up is with people with chronic occlusion, you know, the, that is still somewhat controversial and the, the optimal management and timing of revascularization is not really well established yet. And, you know, in any cerebrovascular talk, it would be remiss without mentioning Dr. Yasser but he was one of the pioneers of bypass surgery, and he published that um, technique in uh, 1967. Um, the focus of this talk is going to be more for endovascular approaches for, these type, for this type of pathology, and endovascular revascularization for this was reported by uh, Tarada in uh, 2005. And the four primary mechanisms uh, by which uh, vascular events occur is um, you have hyperperfusion, which is uh, basically just not enough blood flow, not enough oxygen reaching the, the uh, cortex. Now you have focal thrombosis. So focal thrombosis kind of refers to someone who has a dissection in, in that dissection flap ultimately leads to 
a thrombosis and, and, and occlusion of that vessel. And thromboembolic kind of refers to almost like a stump syndrome. You have somebody who is occluded, but uh, you know, there is a small stump there and there's you know, tiny emboli that, that are um, dislodged and, and cause embolic events. And, and then you have occlusion of perforating vessels. And these are often like your uh, collaterals that develop from with this chronic occlusion, you have um, neovascularization that occurs in that ischemic tissue. And some of those perforators, uh, they occlude from for a reason or another, whether it's hypotension, hyperperfusion, or some sort of micro uh, embolus that um, <clears throat> occurs in that location. And so when we um, assess a patient who has an, a known occlusion, what we want to assess, and one of the more difficult things to determine is, what is their cerebrovascular reserve? So cerebrovascular reserve is probably the most important important predictor of ischemic events. And what that uh, tells us is uh, how, how well is the patient compensating for this loss of circulation from one of the carotids. And one of the, there's several different methods that have been published in the literature and um, the more mainstream methods and a lot of what we do here is um, we assess uh, response to induction of cerebral vasodilation. And so how do we do that? We do that by um, increasing someone's CO2 by about eight millimeters of mercury or more. And it's achieved by, you know, historically it's been achieved by, um, you know, you have somebody uh, doing multiple breath holds. If you look at the old school literature and, you know, assessing entitled CO2 and seeing um, that rise, we have, um, a Respirac protocol where you, you have a titrated concentration of uh, you know 95% O2 and 5% CO2 that gradually will elevate someone's CO2. You can also uh, supplement this with all, a cetazolamide administration and that um, induction of cerebrovasodilation will help um, elucidate asymmetry in um, perfusion. And that's the uh, formula there for calculating um, someone's cerebrovascular reserve. And man, many different methods have been used and published, but the, the most practical um, has been MRI and reliable has been MRI. And then we go to another factor is someone's oxygen extraction fraction. And this is probably the most important indicator of need for recanalization. And, Unfortunately, it's probably the hardest to reliably assess. Um, you know, PET scanning in the literature is what they say is the gold standard method for measurement of this. But, um, you know, MRI techniques are starting to emerge. But basically, when somebody's oxygen ex extraction fraction starts to increase, um, with that is an indicator that they're starting to um, their impending failure, essentially. Um, when we look at the stages of impairment of someone's uh, cerebrovascular reserve, so stage zero, we kind of classify that as, um, you know, they're unimpaired. Uh, one, you have normal hemodynamics. So someone's CVF and extraction fraction are preserved. You have adequate collaterals uh, through a number of avenues. You have the contralateral ICA, um, and you have anterior communicating artery and posterior circulation also supplying via the posterior communicating artery. Stage two is what we call, um, and is called uh, misery perfusion. So you start to have uh, inadequate collaterals. Your auto regulation starts to become exhausted. The brain, in essence, is, is becoming miserable. <laughs> Is, is just the way I think about it. And your mean transit time increases, your CBF starts to decrease and your oxygen extraction fraction starts to increase. And then stage three is just failure. Um, you start to have signs and symptoms um, of ischemia, you have infarction. And that's because the uh, CBF and OEF and collaterals are uh, at the point where they cannot 
meet the metabolic demand. And so when we talk about the clinical presentation, I like to uh, kind of think of a you know four wheels of a, of a car here. So you have two arteries in the front, the carotids, two arteries in the back, the vertebral arteries. Um, you know, you can see this picture here, if anyone's an F1 uh, fan, Lewis Hamilton won the British Grand Prix on three tires in the final lap. Um, you know, he was driving 140 miles per hour on, on three wheels, which was, you know, something to see. But that's kind of how I liken this to some people who are starting to, you know, they're performing, you know, they're asymptomatic, questionably teetering on the edge, and then ultimately, you know, they're maintaining, maintaining until eventually something gives, you know, they're no longer able to, you know, if he had kept going, eventually, you know, he would have, this car would have, you know, been completely trashed. So I, I kind of liken that similar analogy to the way our, our vessels work. Somebody is asymptomatic, they may start to show subtle signs of, of uh, impairment. And I think that's, that's the area that we are, are struggling to capture who should we treat in these situations. Obviously, I think it's pretty well established that people with recurrent neurological symptoms and people with intracranial occlusion, signs of, of infarct, they for sure need treatment. It's the latter two, excuse me, the former two that, that we need to elucidate a little bit more. So the different strategies of management for these patients, um, medical management obviously is the first line. Um, you have monotherapy versus dual antiplatelet therapy. And then there's anticoagulation depending on the patient's um, uh, progression of symptoms and their other medical comorbidities. Carotid arteriectomy has also been very well established for carotid stenosis, um, not very well established for carotid occlusion. Um, and bypass, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the evidence for that, but those are also other options. You have direct and indirect, you have direct um, EC to IC bypass, STA to MCA, or um, even like uh, a high flow bypass, such as using the internal maxillary artery. Um, indirect, you have uh, EDAS, ED, EDAMs, and then you have peosynangiosis as well. So the <clears throat> endovascular approaches, uh, carotid angioplasty and stenting with flow reversal or flow arrest. Um, and then another technique that's also been discussed is a combination of carotid endarterectomy plus carotid artery stenting. That's, that's been starting to gain more popularity in the literature, in the, especially in uh, China uh, and Japan, that <clears throat> is noted in the literature. So um, for endovascular recanalization, um, as I mentioned before, Tirada uh, uh, published the first successful recanalization uh, of a chronic occlusion in 2005. Um, and this was performed under flow reversal. It was an older uh, uh, generation technology, um, not like what they use with TCAR now, but um, he later published a uh, series where in 15 patients, he achieved successful recanalization in 14 of them. And this was also followed up with more um, successful reports of recanalization, Cow et al. in 2007. Um, reported 22 out of 30 patients achieved uh, recanalization from an endovascular approach. And he had a restenosis rate of three out of 22. However, one patient did have a fatal brainstem infarct, which it was not really uh, described in the uh, paper what the etiology of that was, although they did say their stent was patent on the follow-up study. Um, so just a little about the controversies in management. Um, so the cost trial, this was uh, a, a trial discussing bypass in the setting of carotid occlusion. Um, this was published in 2011, it was stopped prematurely due to fertility. And this was because medical management was found to be in their study uh, superior essentially to uh, uh, bypass surgery. And it, this was much like Aruba did to AVM surgery. Uh, this, this is what uh, 
uh, the study did for bypass in this uh, in this patient population, um, it it definitely fell out of favor. But when you really deep dive into kind of the controversy surrounding this study, I think it was a lot of technical errors and a lot of uh, different aspects of uh, how bypasses were done that that led to the discrepancy in results. Because um, when you talk to any neurosurgeon, you know that bypass does work. It's just, it, it, it probably needs to be done in, in, in a technically skilled way and people who do it more often than not. Um, the Sam, I, I brought up the Sampras trial here and I think this is the clearest surrogate for me just to, because there's not really a lot of randomized, there's not any randomized trials for this uh, endovascular approach for, for carotid occlusion. But if Sampras looked at um, intracranial uh, stenosis and stenting versus medical management. And you, you can see here that the medical management had much uh, better uh, stroke rate compared to angioplasty and stenting. And again, this is some of the um, related to the technology devices and techniques that were available at that time compared to now. And um, I think there's going to be more research down the pipeline that will show that the, the rates are almost equivocal. Um, and then the largest case series for chronic occlusion um, was published by Chen et al. Um, and that was, they, they had a 61.6% success rate. And um, a couple of things about their study were that 43% of those patients were asymptomatic, 4.3% complication rate. And if you look at the AHA guidelines, they, for patients who are asymptomatic, they want you to have a, a complication rate of 3% or less. And this is a, a kind of a, a table summarizing. You, you can see that these are the series published in the literature. Chen had a series of 138, but if you can, you look at all the different uh, studies there, you know, the next highest total is 33. And um, probably you would see that about a 70% success rate when it comes to uh, overall a successful uh, recanalization and, out and good outcomes. So um, who are the asymptomatic quote unquote patients? I, I say asymptomatic because these are people who I would say are kind of go un, under the radar. You know, they show subtle signs of cognitive impairment. They show subtle neurological findings due to um, lack of cerebral blood flow from a missing uh, entire carotid artery. Um, and this is the, the patient population where more and more data is coming out that Revascularization, despite being quote unquote asymptomatic, really does improve neurocognitive outcomes in people who are chronically hyperperfused. Um, and so, this uh, in this study here by uh, Lynn et al., 10 of 12 patients were able to achieve a successful revascularization, and they had significant improvement in, in various cognitive scores. You can see that um, they had a um, Alzheimer's disease scale, MMSE, and um, a test called the color trail making uh, scale. They used multiple tests and all uh, patients who achieved recanalization um, had signif statistically significant improvements in their in performance on those scores. And this is another study um, uh, <clears throat> that also people, 40, 14 out of the 22 patients, only patients who had abnormal perfusion um, imaging experienced the statistically significant cognitive benefits. So even, uh, so the good thing about this study was that they took into account who were actually showing signs of uh, abnormal uh, perfusion and correlating that to the outcome. So that was another good, Article showing who should, you know, really who might benefit from something like this. And this is another one uh, more recently published as well. Um, 
using the uh, Montreal cognitive scale and all five patients from this uh, in their personal case series experienced an improvement and resolution of the hyperperfusion. And then they did a literature review of 333 patients and found a 70% recanalization rate and 3.9% major and 2.7% uh, minor complication rate, which as I mentioned, you know, this becomes a little um, uh, tricky when, when you reconcile that with, with the complication rate that, that um, the AHA, the stroke guidelines want you to stay under for asymptomatic patients. Um, but it does show that uh, neurocognition is improved in patients who have uh, hyperperfusion and um, occlusion on that side. And some predictors on a technical aspect of this, um, you know, predictors of who is going to have a successful outcome, um, those have been published. And um, these are two different uh, uh, typing systems. One uh, on the right, uh, Dr. Talk was actually a part of. Um, you can see like the type A, you have kind of a tapered stump. Uh, and you have clear avenue into the internal carotid artery. Uh, type B, you don't really have a taper, but there's a clear ICA stump there. Uh, type C and D, these are the ones that um, are on the more difficult scale because you don't really have a clear ICA stump. There's no, there's no real taper leading to it. And in addition, with type D, you don't really see any ECA collaterals. In the other types, you have collaterals from EC, IC, and astomosis, particularly through the ethmoidals leading through the ophthalmic. And then you also have uh, the PCOMs and the ACOMs as well. So um, things that in the literature have been documented to have predictors of uh, success, um, cervical location of the occlusion, a retrograde flow from ECA collaterals, a tapered stump, a length of less than five centimeters. And then ideally, um, you don't want anybody that has been within a month of, of the diagnosis. Um, it, it helps to we assess stability and um, whether they're truly symptomatic from it. Obviously, if they're having really um, uh, disabling symptoms, um, trying to address it would be the, the most appropriate course of action. So some illustrative cases here to kind of uh, bring this home. Uh, so this first case, we have a 63-year-old who's referred um, with recurrent left leg weakness uh, that has improved. And his uh, recent ED visit demonstrated punctate DWI changes, and he had been recently taken off his eloquence. His uh, aspirin, his uh, Plavix was found to be set therapeutic. He was um, subsequently switched to uh, Berlinta. Um, so this is the MRI showing the punctate uh, DWI changes there. And then he has a CTA uh, demonstrating, you can see his, his right ICA is occluded. You can see maybe a, a trickle of something, but that, that um, is not really real. Um, here is his angiogram here. You can see the retrograde flow into the uh, ICA via the, the external anastomosis. And then you can see he's somebody who's been, this is a left ICA injection. You can see a lot of his circulation and his left vert. He has a been getting a lot of collateral flow from the opposite side, but now what's happening with him is it's you know starting to decompensate essentially, and he's starting to have these symptoms coming from this occluded segment. So um, for this patient, he was previously offered a T car by an outside facility, um, but he came to us for a second opinion. So <clears throat> an endovascular approach. Um, was offered and he underwent a transfemoral approach um, with proximal flow arrest with the MoMA device, which um, you can see in this picture here, <clears throat> this, the MoMA is essentially a catheter that has two balloons, one 
at the distal end that goes into the external carotid artery and you inflate it. And then it has a proximal balloon that inflates in the common carotid artery and that induces flow rest. And you also have no reflux from the external carotid artery. And he had a um, specifically went underwent a successful stenting and he has um, remained asymptomatic since that time you can see here, stent in place and restoration of flow there. Um, the second case is a, a bit of a unique case and um, is an 84 year old. He had presented with right-sided visual loss six months prior and was found to have severe left carotid disease. He was initially offered a CEA at an outside facility. However, um, his platelet count was 50,000 and, and the procedure was canceled. So he came to us for uh, further management. And you can see here, this patient, he has a probably type A here. It's a tapered stump. And you can see there's retrograde flow from the ECAs there. And not much, nothing going intracranially. It's like functionally, he, this patient is occluded. And so again, he was another patient that underwent a endovascular approach, which it became very, um, you know, when somebody who has a platelet count of 50,000, what is the, truly the best approach for them? Um, they're going to be on dual antiplatelets. They're going to get heparinized during the procedure. Um, you know, open surgery versus endovascular, they're both not without risk. And so he also underwent uh, proximal flow arrest. He was able to um, get successful recanalization of this artery with restoration of intracranial flow, you can see there. He was kept on a low dose heparin drip overnight. He was very slow to um, start. He was on aspirin and heparin and then was started on a, on a Plavix after um, it was his uh, growing site was noted to be stable and he was not having any signs of a bleeding complication. And so this um, third case, I think, is an uh, illustration of somebody who is going from that stage two to stage three from like they're slowly, uh, you know, going from that misery perfusion to, you know, complete failure. And it was interesting to see this type of uh, presentation in real time. You can see he's a 63-year-old presented with right facial droop, right-sided weakness, NIH 11. And you can see he has no um, evidence of filling in the ICA there. And you trace that down to the cervical region. And I think my presentation just froze there. I apologize. So uh, the patient, yeah. Let me go back. Okay. Okay, so um, he had uh, evidence of uh, hyperperfusion on that, uh, uh, the left hemisphere there with increased uh, Tmax, and uh, reduced, I'm sorry, increased mean transit time. So um, the interesting thing about his presentation, somebody with the left IC occlusion should be significantly worse than an NIH 11. After the imaging was completed, he improved to essentially an NIH of one. Um, <clears throat> and then after orthostatic testing about 30 minutes later, you know, his symptoms returned. So he was taken urgently for endovascular intervention. Um, he was treated, we, we used a balloon guide catheter. And what you can see here is you have that non-tapered stump there um, and no clear path to the internal carotid artery. And so this is us, this is an illustration of trying to take the microwire and access the artery and eventually, you know, poking and prodding. These are technically frustrating procedures 
Um, you have to be very patient um, and scale up. Some people will talk about using very stiff wires, back of a glide wire. Um, and those are the things that you know do work, but they also increase your risk for potential complication if, if you get too uh, frustrated and try to force the issue too much. So after we were able to get distal access, um, we were able to um, get a balloon across to uh, dilate the, the proximal ICA, and we were able to get an aspiration catheter across. And there was noted to be a um, left M1 clot here where we were able to get a um, uh, stent retriever across to perform a thrombectomy. And then here, um, as we were coming out, you could clearly see that the ICA was reoccluding um, as we were working. And so serial angioplasty was performed and uh, stent was deployed acutely in that setting. And so um, he received, you know, the uh, acute loading dose of Plavix, aspirin rectally, and then he also got Agrostat IA interarterially and um, intravenously. And he improved to NIH zero the following day and did, did extremely well, all things considered. Um, so to summarize kind of how, how we select patients for this, um, you know, red people who just don't offer immediate treatment. People who are truly asymptomatic. They show so, so no signs of impairment. Um, just maximize medical management. Those who maybe show subtle signs, you know, how can we detect this? It's very important that you have good neurologists who um, know the signs. You have involved families who know the signs and they can conduct the appropriate testing. Without the appropriate testing, oftentimes these things are missed. And um, a couple benchmarks potentially to, to set, you know, someone with a MOCA of less than 26 or MMSE of mini mental status exam of less than 24. And it's important that it's in the setting of hyperperfusion as well. Um, otherwise, you know, these could be more uh, organic things that are not related to, you know, the circulation. And then obviously, as we mentioned, treatment green light is indicated for, you know, uh, recurrent neurological symptoms, someone with like a stump syndrome or somebody who develops a complete intracranial occlusion with uh, you know, hyperperfusion and potentially disabling or lasting deficits. And to define, again, hyperperfusion, you have a reduced CBF in response to cerebral dilation challenge with increased transit time and increased oxygen extraction fraction. And then obviously endovascular patients, people who are poor surgical candidates, um, often it, endovascular may be their only chance. Somebody with a platelet of 50 and, or, and you can't get them above 50, maybe endovascular is the only chance they have. Maybe a transradial approach to try and address this if their anatomy is suitable is, is something that is their only chance. So um, in summary, uh, that's it. I just thank the neurovascular team, Dr. Talk, Dr. Fox, Miller, and Wynn, and then my partner in crime, Dr. Wad. Um, for helping me through this year. Uh, references, and then I think I saw Dr. Fox on, if you have any comments or anything to add, or anyone else yes, from yeah. the neurovascular team. Hey, Samir, how well, are you? We're here. Yeah, good talk. Um, tough topic. And uh, I mean, in terms of treating these patients, knowing exactly what to do, um, very challenging. Um, Lots of uh, stuff in the literature that, to be honest, kind of puts us in a place where we're painted into a corner sometimes, um, but we do see patients who have recurrent symptoms and are not doing well with medical management. And I think, um, you know, this is more just a comment, but I like how you, um, you, you touched on the various options and ways to try to narrow this down and who's, who's um, best being treated. I think it's important that we really consider, um, you know, in all of our practices, trying to identify the patients who we can best help and we have the least amount of likelihood to hurt. If I think back to when Wingspan came out, 
And everyone started just throwing wingspan in every time there was an intracranial atherosclerotic lesion. And uh, what ended up happening was a lot of patients didn't do well in that device, which we know works very well in the right patient, almost was completely banned from being used. I mean, not used, it was almost completely taken off the market, which would have been a disservice to patients. So I think, you know, making sure we have very clear indications using the literature that we have using some of the newer um, diagnostic tools like bold studies, trying to look at the overall balance of um, cerebral metabolism um, will help us choose these patients. And then, you know, on top of that, like you mentioned, there's, there's lots of new device technology out there to help us with these um, sorts of lesions that we could only imagine treating endovascularly only a few years ago. So um, really nice job putting that all together. And uh, thanks for, thanks for your talk. Thank you. Great talk, Samir. Um, I think you, you touched based on, 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 on the main things for this topic. And I think personally that this is a little bit of an abandoned topic because this is an area of, of a lot of gray zones uh, that was built on failure of major trials, basically. But if you look at it, uh, the fact is some patients need it and you have to do it. And uh, from my perspective, it's a way better option than a bypass because the bypass, I'm putting a two millimeter vessel, one millimeter vessel. This one is really restoring carotid circulation to the whole hand. And in cases when it's successful, it's, it's really, it's really good. Um, and you touched base on the techniques. I think the, the, when it extends intracranially, I don't try it basically, but as long as it's extracranial, I don't hesitate to try it when needed for those patients. And you have the acute versus chronic. And the acute, I think we solve it out. It's all indications for stroke intervention. The subacute are tough because you have a clot on the vessel, and then if you recanalize it, you can you can uh, embolize it. The chronic ones, most of them are fibrotic, like there's no clots in the vessel. So that's how I divide it. But but I like your classification when you do it, when you shouldn't do it. So nice job. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I would add that, that, you know, it's a fascinating topic. Um, you know, we have all kinds of people who walk into our offices all the time with one carotid occluded and them never having known that. Um, it happens for trauma, it happens through atherosclerosis, et cetera, et cetera. Many people don't end up with symptoms, but the, the, uh, there are subtle symptoms which you, you touched on well. And um, yet, and we also know that, that sometimes a chronically occluded carotids spontaneously recanalize. So we know that in some patients, there seems to be a demand there, they, they actually recanalize and patients do well. Um, it's not common, but you see it every now and then. Uh, so then it, it really is, is, is knowing that there are some, especially the, the neurocognitive changes, there are subtle things that some patients suffer from. There are patients who would benefit from being recanalized. But uh, the question is who, what that population is, and uh, you know, how, how, uh, how, and what the risks are to doing so. And I think your talk touched on all of those things. So it was a really good review of that, and we appreciate it. It's still a tough topic, um, but as Dr. Fox and Dr. Talkin uh, mentioned, uh, you know, there, there are lots of uh, alternatives now, uh, and I think that these patients uh, deserve being uh, reviewed and, uh, in some cases, deserve the treatment. You know, great, great talk. Uh, you know, this really doesn't have much to do about this, but, you know, I was really interested in that second case and how you guys manage uh, patients that obviously need considerably needs to be on antiplatelets and then also has low uh, thrombocytopenia. How do you guys go about uh, dealing with that and determining which way to go for those patients? Yeah, I mean, um, if it's anything I learned from Dr. Fox, let's go radial first. <laughs> I mean, uh, the radial, radial approach for the thrombocytopenic patients is, used, is like a go-to in my mind. I mean, that's always going to be my first option. Um, but for something like carotid stenting, it's very difficult because you need a larger bore, you need a larger French catheter system, and then the access, like especially if it's a left carotid, and sometimes the angles to the right carotid make it difficult. Um, but that would be the first step. But if you have to go transfemoral, just be judicious and careful about um, uh, how you, uh, how aggressively you do it. Um, 
And I think in that second case, you know, we did a, a heparin infusion along with aspirin overnight. Uh, after he got loaded with 600 aspirin, I think that was a good uh, call just to say if, you know, if he does develop any bleeding complications, you can easily reverse it. You can give protamine and, and then kind of re, readdress it again at that time. But uh, yeah, I, I think if you ask all four different of our, our faculty, they probably give you four different answers on how they would uh, go go about it in that type of setting. Yeah, and carrying that on, Kingsley, the the uh, the running uh, you know a month or two of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in somebody with uh, markedly reduced platelets is a challenge, um, and uh, it uh, it becomes very tricky sometimes. Uh, you know, Plavix, uh, uh, depending on what kind of a responder the patient is, Plavix allows you some uh, ability to play with your P2Y12. So you can, you know, Berlint is extremely effective, works pretty, uh, pretty completely as soon as you give the medication. With some people who are not as uh, good responders or as, you know, significant responders to Plavix, you can sort of try to play with uh, the medication and keep the uh, P2Y12 towards the, the minimum uh, um, effective dose as opposed to, um, you know, something like Berlinta, which, which markedly reduces their, their uh, platelet function. So you kind of have to play with it, but it, it is, uh, they, those patients are a challenge and sometimes you end up, um, you know, monitoring them much more closely and monitoring their platelet uh, activity uh, a lot more closely in the, in, you know, in the time that you need. The good thing about the carotid is that unlike intracranial things, you don't need nearly as uh, long a, a uh, a, a period of dual antiplatelet after the stent is placed because of the larger vo uh, the larger diameter of the vessel, but it uh, but yeah you're right it's a real challenge in some of these patients. So you said and, some, and sometimes you, you again if in those patients with that kind of a thing, uh, you know it, you may be a, a better option may be to give them a platelet transfusion, do a, a surgical procedure, you know, do it, do it uh, open as opposed to endovascular, uh, and then you don't have the issues uh, of long-term uh, dual antiplatelet therapy in somebody who's going to be chronically uh, um, platelet deficient. There, there is no guideline, but definitely those people need adjustment of our anticoagulation because going back, I mean, if I, if I have to remember my case and the complications is whenever you have some cytopenia because our standard of care is aspirin, plavix, and heparin, and then that's for people with normal platelets, but there's nothing in the research that says anything, how you adjust for thrombocytopenic patients. And going back for my patients, the, it, I was definitely, I had, compli the, the complications I had have been several of them on those patients. So it's, a, it's definitely a, a, a high-risk population. Yeah, so I go, I go, I go halfway on those sometimes. I just don't give the full thing. Yeah, I think that continues to be a challenge throughout uh, all of neurosurgery, certainly in spine, and I know certainly in uh, uh, vascular for you guys as well. You know, this was a great talk and uh, uh, Samir, really nice uh, presentation, and um, really want to thank everybody for joining us this morning. And uh, if anyone, unless there's any other comments, I'd like to say, have a great uh, start to your week. All right. Thank you. Have a good day. Well done, Samir. Thank you. Thank you.